I'm Jake O'Neill, creator of Animographs, and this is how a car engine works. Let's start at a single piston, the powerhouse of the engine, and work our way outwards. The four-stroke cycle. When a piston travels to the end of its range, whether up or down, that's a stroke. Car engines use a four-stroke cycle, and it goes like this. First, intake. The piston descends, sucking an air-fuel mixture into the cylinder through the intake port, with both intake valves open. Next, compression. With all valves closed, the piston comes back up, compressing the fuel and air mixture for more powerful combustion. Then, the power stroke. An electrical spark ignites the compressed fuel and air mixture, and the resulting combustion forces the piston to the bottom of the cylinder again. A connecting rod transfers this power to the crankshaft. Finally, exhaust. The piston comes back up, pushing the spent mixture out through open exhaust valves and the exhaust port. Connecting multiple pistons. For smooth power delivery, pistons take turns firing. The firing order for this engine is one, three, four, two. Camshafts with specially shaped cams push spring-loaded valves open in turn. Cam gears and a timing belt or chain links everything to the crankshaft and it all spins together. The crankshaft translates piston power out of the engine. It has counterweights to balance against the pistons for perfectly smooth revolutions. This is what RPM means. We're counting the number of full crankshaft revolutions per minute. The engine block holds the crankshaft and cylinders. And the cylinder head holds valves, ports, cams, etc. A geared flywheel sits at one side of the crankshaft for connection to a transmission. It's also where the starter connects to the system. This engine has four cylinders arranged in a single row, but there are many other possible configurations, like six cylinders with three on each side, angled in a V-shape, or eight. Despite different design goals, the basic engine parts are all there. Now let's look at other systems that support this combustion process. Air intake. Air comes in through the air filter and then into the intake manifold where it mixes with fuel before being sucked into individual cylinders through intake ports. Fuel. The fuel pump carries gas from the tank through a fuel filter to the engine, where fuel injectors emit a precisely timed spray of gas into the intake port. Cooling. Engines get very hot during operation and require a cooling system. Coolant channels around the cylinders and through the cylinder heads carry a special liquid called antifreeze to keep temperatures within safe operating range. It's called antifreeze because it won't freeze in icy weather. After cooling hot engine parts, coolant circulates through the radiator. The radiator has a network of small tubes and fins. Coolant passes through these channels while air, pulled in by the radiator fan, blows by the tubes, cooling the hot liquid for recirculation. A water pump keeps the coolant system flowing and properly pressurized. The thermostat regulates coolant temperature by either routing coolant back through the engine or to the radiator for further cooling. 
electrical. The spark plug delivers the electrical spark that ignites the fuel-air mixture for combustion. The metal core is insulated from the outer metal casing with porcelain. The spark jumps between these conductive surfaces. The coil pack delivers electrical current to the spark plugs as directed by the ECM, or Engine Control Module. The ECM is a computer that directs many core engine functions like spark timing, valve open and close timing, air to fuel ratio, etc. The alternator works like a power generator, converting the engine's mechanical energy into electricity to charge the battery or run other electrical systems while the engine is running. The battery provides power to the starter for engine start. Oil. Motor oil is used to lubricate, clean, prevent corrosion, improve sealing, and cool the engine by carrying heat away from moving parts. Rings around the top of the piston head keep oil out of the combustion process, while otherwise allowing the cylinder to be lubricated. Oil galleries are channels through the engine block and cylinder head that carry oil to various engine parts. Oil flows through the engine and back to the oil pan for recirculation. Oil rests in the oil pan when not in circulation. The oil pump keeps oil properly pressurized and flowing and the oil filter keeps oil clean from contaminants. Exhaust. The exhaust manifold collects gases from multiple cylinders into one pipe. Exhaust flows through the catalytic converter, which captures toxic chemicals in engine exhaust and then out through a muffler that reduces exhaust noise. And finally, here's the full functioning engine with all the basic systems we've discussed. Cars have been powered by steam, petrol and electricity and there's a very good chance that in 20 years time no one will need to learn to drive because all cars will be fully automated or maybe there won't be cars. We'll teleport everywhere. Before engines were invented, a horse and cart was the fastest way to get around. He does 0 to 30 in under two minutes. And check out that chassis. Yeah, sweet. I keep him in high performance fuel. He won't let you down. Check out that exhaust too, ha <laughs> The very first cars were steam powered and could only do six miles per hour. That's like a slow jog. But then in 1906, someone came along and smashed that speed. His name was Fred Marriott and he built a car that went a whopping 127 miles per hour. Hey, where is your steering wheel, Fred? Huh? Oh, the first cars didn't have steering wheels. They had a lever instead. Steering wheel? Gotta be in here somewhere. Um, it's in here? Pretty soon, everyone wanted a car. So factories began to mass produce them. Thousands of cars are made in factories every day. And that's been happening for over a hundred years. No wonder there's so many cars on the road. Oh, oh, oh. 
These days, we're making cars that run on electricity, so you can plug them into charge, just like you would your phone. No more trips to the petrol station. Self-driving cars are the future though. They're being tested in cities all over the world. Like the very first cars, the steam-powered ones, they don't have steering wheels either. <laughs> Cars need energy to move, a bit like us. An engine has cylinders and pistons. When the pistons go down, petrol and air is sucked in. When the pistons go up, the air and petrol is squashed and ignited, creating a mini explosion. That explosion forces the pistons down again. It's the up and down movement of the pistons that generate the power and turn the axles and the wheels. Let me show you how you can make this cool Lego car move by itself. For this, you're going to need an elastic band. Uh, guys, guys, I said just one. Very funny. By winding the elastic band, we create the energy needed to drive the car forward. This episode of Science Scout takes it to the next level. Today we'll be discussing another interesting topic which revolves around hydrogen cars and fuel cell technology. Have you ever heard about Tesla or Elon Musk? Tesla is an electric car company owned by Elon Musk. The car company came into the limelight in late 2019 when its stock value suddenly skyrocketed. It made one thing clear. Electric cars are going to share future car market with some dominance. Almost all car manufacturing companies are producing electric units in their dedicated production plants, Tesla being the forerunner with a big lead. What lies in the future? We have two main questions. Do electric cars have a bright future? Definitely yes. Is there any threat to the popularity of electric cars in the future? Definitely yes. One of the first hydrogen cars sold is the 2015 Toyota Mirai. Since then, there has been an addition of more than 8,000 cars in the United States till the end of 2019. On the other hand, battery electric vehicles sold in the United States were about 245,000 in 2019, with Tesla models accounting for almost 80% of it. While some 330,000 plug-in electric cars were also sold in the States last year, so how does a hydrogen engine work? Powered with electric motors, hydrogen fuel cell cars are also known as e-cars. The common abbreviation is FCEV, short for fuel cell electric vehicle, in contrast to a BEV, or battery electric vehicle. 
One main difference between electric cars and hydrogen cars is the source of electricity. While electric cars run on batteries charged electrically, hydrogen cars produce their own electricity as they have their little power plant on board. This power plant is the fuel cell. First comes air. The FCEV's front intake grills deliver the outside air to the fuel cell system, which makes electricity. Hydrogen travels from the tanks to the fuel cell system. In the fuel cell system, hydrogen and oxygen from the air combine in a chemical reaction that creates electricity to power the vehicle, moving you forward. When you put your foot on the accelerator, electricity from the fuel cell system is sent to the motor, leaving nothing but water. In the end, the only byproduct of creating electricity with hydrogen and oxygen in our fuel cell system is water, which leaves through a hatch located on the bottom of the Mirai. What is a hydrogen fuel cell? A fuel cell is an electrochemical cell that converts chemical energy of a fuel into electricity by hosting some reactions. In the fuel cell of an FCEV, or fuel cell electric vehicle, electrical energy is produced with the reaction of hydrogen and oxygen with the help of electrolysis to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. The electrolyzer consists of two metal-coated electrodes and a DC power source, which provides a negative and positive charge. Hydrogen will appear at the cathode, the negative electrode where electrons react with the water to form hydrogen and hydroxide ions. These negative ions, now present in the water, are attracted to the anode, or positive electrode, where the electrons react with the water to form hydrogen and hydroxide ions. These negative ions, now present in the water, are attracted to the anode or positive electrode, where they are oxidized to form oxygen and water. The rate of production of oxygen and hydrogen depends on the electric current, but pure water is not very conductive. To achieve adequate hydrogen production, we would need to increase the voltage, or increase the conductivity. It's much more efficient to increase conductivity. So, an electrolyte in the form of salt is often included as a charge carrier. Let's take a closer look at how fuel cells work. The fuel cell stack is composed of several hundred cells. There are several types of fuel cells which include alkali, molten carbonate, phosphoric acid, proton exchange membrane, and solid oxide fuel cells. They each operate a bit differently, but all consist of two electrodes, a negative electrode, also called the anode, and a positive electrode, also called the cathode. In order to obtain energy for the vehicle, we need to rejoin the hydrogen with oxygen, and this is done most efficiently in what is called a fuel cell. In an ordinary electric cell, a metal, say zinc, ionizes at one electrode, the anode giving off two electrons. The electrons are pushed around the circuit, carrying energy. For example, a motor, and absorbed by metal ions of a less reactive metal, say copper. The circuit is completed by the movement of metal ions through the solution in a fuel cell. The reactants are gases instead of metals. Hydrogen then gives its electrons, which flow round, driving the motor, and arrive at the cathode, where they are recombined with hydrogen in the presence of the reactive gas, oxygen. This provides the driving energy to form water again. The electrodes can be made of porous carbon coated with a catalyst, such as platinum or nickel. The advantage of combining fuel and oxygen in a cell is that you can, in theory, convert most of the chemical energy to electricity, whereas burning them, as it happens in the internal combustion engine of a car, has a maximum efficiency of about 50%. In practice, only about 25% of the chemical energy does the useful work in driving the engine. The rest comes out as waste heat. How is this electrical energy utilized? Electrical energy produced during the electrolysis process goes to either electric motor to power the FCEV directly, or to traction batteries for charging purposes, depending on the driving situation at a specific time, while water leaves the system as water vapor. Traction batteries are smaller and lighter than the batteries used in electric cars. Like other e-cars, hydrogen vehicles can also recover or recuperate braking energy. The electric motor converts the car's kinetic energy back into electrical energy and feeds it into the backup battery. Let's look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of hydrogen-powered cars for users. The pros and cons of a particular propulsion technology can be seen from two main perspectives, that of the user 
and that of the environment. First, hydrogen as an energy source is very promising. For example, hydrogen in itself is an energy storage medium, storing energy in the form of gas or liquid. This stored energy will never dissipate until it is used. This is unlike batteries and capacitors, which can lose their stored energy over time, even without use. Though hydrogen molecules usually require a lot of resources to annex, however, the fact remains that it's a renewable energy source that is bountifully and infinitely available. Also, unlike fossil fuel combustion engines, the byproduct of the combustion of hydrogen in fuel cells include energy, water, and heat. No greenhouse gas is produced, making hydrogen clean, non-toxic, and safe for all components of our planet. Besides, Hydrogen energy is three times more potent than gasoline and other fossil-based sources of fuel. This means that you need less hydrogen to complete an enormous task. This is why hydrogen is commonly used as fuel for spaceships. A vehicle that utilizes hydrogen energy will travel more miles for almost 300 miles with full hydrogen tanks than one that uses electric battery. Also, vehicles that use hydrogen take between three to four minutes to refill while those that use battery take between 30 minutes to 12 hours to refill. That's a lot of time to spare. Moreover, hydrogen cars have pure electrical propulsion, resulting in virtually no engine noise at all. Despite all these advantages, hydrogen energy has its disadvantages. The biggest disadvantage of this technology is the non-availability of refueling stations. Special fuel pumps for these cars are as low as 41 in the United States, compared to 80 in Germany. Low numbers of on-road hydrogen vehicles don't encourage operators to establish special refuel pumps. The irony is, the few fueling stations are a major reason for less hydrogen cars on roads. Chicken and egg problem, right? BMW's homeland of Germany leads the way in terms of finding a solution. They have joined a program with hydrogen producers and operators to expand the hydrogen fueling station network to 130 stations in the next three years, fueling up 60,000 cars in Germany. The next target is to establish 400 stations by 2025. Now, let's talk about the cost. The other reason we see less hydrogen cars on the road is the price. For example, in terms of range and distance, FCV tends to perform better than BEV. The more expensive mass-produced electric cars that tend to offer battery ranges of about 300 miles is the Tesla Model 3 Long Range that has a range of 322 miles with a price tag of $40,000. On the other hand, the hydrogen-powered Hyundai Nexo comes with a real-world range of 414 miles with a price tag of $59,000. So in terms of range alone, hydrogen vehicles have the upper hand. In addition to less industrialized production, these cars are expensive because platinum is used as a catalyst during the power generation. As the metal is expensive, manufacturers are trying to reduce its need to reduce the total cost of a hydrogen car. The cost will be the same to that of the electric cars once the desired platinum reduction is observed in manufacturing. The other problem with the hydrogen cars is their size. Hydrogen tanks take a lot of space hence increasing the unit's size. The reason electric cars are smaller in size is that they don't need such a dedicated arrangement. Operating costs is yet another reason in slow mass adoption of these cars. On average, hydrogen fuel prices $13.9 per kilogram, while gasoline prices are around $2.44 per gallon. Hydrogen cars use an average of 0.8 kilograms of hydrogen per 100 kilometers, while petrol cars use around 1.5 gallons of petrol per 100 kilometers. So, if you spend $70 to get 5 kilograms of hydrogen and $40 to get 16 gallons of petrol, a hydrogen car will only travel a distance of 625 kilometers, while a petrol-powered vehicle can go as far as 1,090 kilometers. That's a huge difference. However, NREL estimates that hydrogen fuel prices may fall to the $10 to $8 per kilogram range in the 2020 to 2025 period. But the question is, which energy has the best efficiency and is the most cost-effective for driving e-cars, battery or hydrogen operation? 
With battery-powered e-cars, only 8% of the energy is lost during transport before the electricity is stored in the batteries of the vehicle. When the electrical energy used to drive the electric motor is converted, another 18% is lost. This gives the battery-operated electric car an efficiency level of between 70 to 80%, depending on the model. With the hydrogen-powered electric car, the losses are significantly greater. 45% of the energy is already lost during the production of hydrogen through electrolysis. Of this remaining 55% of the original energy, another 55% is lost when hydrogen is converted into electricity in the vehicle. This means that the hydrogen-powered electric car only achieves an efficiency of between 25-35%, to 35%, depending on the model. For the sake of completeness, when alternative fuels are burned, the efficiency is even worse, only 10-20% to 20 overall efficiency. One of the major concerns is whether fuel cell technology is environmentally friendly. An ideal car would be using renewable energy with no harmful emissions at all. Is hydrogen car an ideal car? Let's have a look. Its propulsion system is designed to reduce the emission of harmful substances like CO2 and other oxides. Exhaust of a hydrogen car has just water vapors in it, making it suitable for air. Is it good for the climate too? An important factor regarding FCV's impact on environment is how hydrogen is being produced. There are at least two ways to produce hydrogen. If fossil fuels are used to produce hydrogen, carbon emissions are going to affect the climate, just like electric cars. If hydrogen is being produced with the help of electrolysis, the climate is not being polluted. In terms of greenhouse emissions, when we consider the whole production processes of the hydrogen and electric cars, there's actually a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. For example, to produce a 100 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery for an electric vehicle, it will take around 20 tons of carbon dioxide, and a typical battery lasts for 150,000 miles. So, that equates to about 83 grams per kilometer of carbon dioxide. Then, when you consider charging over that same distance, the same battery car will deliver 124 grams per kilometer of carbon dioxide over its lifetime. By comparison, a study found that a Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell car produces around 120 grams per kilometer of carbon dioxide over its lifetime when all its current manufacturing processes are taken into account. However, if hydrogen can be produced by renewable energy, the amount of carbon dioxide released could be reduced significantly. Let's delve a bit more into safety requirements. Global Technical Regulation Number 13 is an agreement between Japan, Europe, and North America that sets the safety requirements that all high-pressure hydrogen systems must adhere to. Compliance with this regulation is tough and requires hydrogen tanks to be dropped, frozen, damaged, exposed to chemicals, hydraulically and pneumatically cycled, stuck on a bonfire, and ultimately burst to ensure tank performance throughout the lifetime of the vehicle. Therefore, Engineers have worked to ensure that hydrogen tanks are designed not to leak. The new multi-patented carbon fiber wrapped polymer line tanks are built in a three-layer structure and absorb five times the crash energy of steel. In a high-speed collision, sensors stop the flow of hydrogen. To prevent hydrogen from traveling to potentially damaged systems outside of the tank, the system is designed to automatically shut off the tank's hydrogen output valve. Any leaked hydrogen is quickly dispersed. All hydrogen-related parts are located outside the cabin and are designed to help prevent leaked hydrogen from building up. Toyota even tested their carbon fiber tank by shooting it with a 50 caliber round. The tank didn't explode, it simply released hydrogen safely into the atmosphere. Since hydrogen is lighter than air, it rapidly disperses, reducing the time to cause damage in the event of an ignition. Hydrogen is arguably safer than gasoline, so safety isn't a huge concern for hydrogen. Now my next question, how much does hydrogen production cost? As I've said before, price is a huge factor in the production of hydrogen. For example, hydrogen production cost from natural gas via steam reforming of methane is 1.25 US dollars per kilogram for larger scales to 3.50 US dollars per kilogram for smaller setups. If the natural gas price remains at 0.3 US dollars per kilogram, if hydrogen is produced through electrolysis, a 100% efficient electrolyzer will require 39 kilowatt hours of electricity 
to produce one kilogram of hydrogen. However, the devices available today require as much as 48 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. In the USA, the average industrial electricity cost is approximately 0.06 US dollars per kilowatt hour. Assuming they even enjoyed an electricity cost of 0.05 US dollars per kilowatt hour, the power cost for the electrolysis process alone will be 2.40 US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. However, one advantage of electrolysis is that it is capable of producing more than 99.999% pure hydrogen, which is good for FCVs. How well distributed are FCVs as of present? Well, if you live in California, there's a chance you might have come across one FCV before. There are nearly 8,363 of them currently on California roads. The Low Carbon Fuel Standards, LCFS, Hydrogen Refueling Infrastructure, HRI, credit provisions took effect, predicated on the goal of reaching 200 hydrogen stations by 2025. The four California stations are the first of a series of stations intended by Iwatani for deployment in the western part of the United States. Current auto manufacturer provided projections for on-the-road FCEVs are 26,900 in 2022 and 48,000 in 2025. Today's network of 41 open hydrogen fueling stations has established the early fueling market that enabled the launch of the FCEV consumer market in California. Of the 24 funded stations currently under construction, 11 are projected to open later this year. So that ends this topic. I hope you have been able to gain something new today about hydrogen cars and fuel cell technology. Are you interested in learning about how tidal energy can solve our energy problem? Watch the next video. So if you like this video, please don't forget to leave a like to support the channel so that we can continue to bring you more great content. And speaking of great content, why not turn that red subscribe button gray and ring that notification bell? That way you will be notified every time we bring out a new video. Thanks for watching and never stop learning.